Welcome this morning to everybody. Glad to see you here. We're in the middle of a series called You Got Soul. Soul. You like saying that, don't you? And uh, we had a great kickoff to our service today, didn't we? Yeah. Soul, man. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Fun, fun stuff. And uh, we're in this series because basically, if we don't talk about it here, no one else is going to talk about your soul. And we've learned that your soul is the most important part of you. In fact, it is you, and uh, it is the most important part of you. And so we started this a few weeks ago. If you've missed any of the installments in this series, I invite you to go back to our website and uh, watch those. And uh, what we learned a couple weeks ago was simply this, as your soul goes, so goes your soul. Life, that no matter what is going on in your life, if your soul is good, everything is good. Regardless of your, uh, your external circumstances, if they're good, if they're bad, it doesn't make any difference because if on the inside your soul is going well, then everything is just fine. How many of you understand that? Yeah. Many of you have been through a difficult time, but because, because you were good on the inside, it was all right. There was a peace there. Some of you have had great times, but on the inside there's turmoil and yet, so it's not good. So as, your, as, your, as goes your soul, goes, so goes your life. And then this last week we talked about this. If your soul is to be healthy, it requires your attention. And so we talked about how the scripture uh, encourages us to talk to our soul, to talk to our soul. And so I gave you a list of questions last week to, to think through and to start asking yourself. And uh, how many of you actually did this this week? All right, yeah, a few of you are like, well, I don't know. I don't know what I... But really, if, we're, if our soul is to be healthy, then we have to pay attention to it. And part of it is just saying, why am I feeling the way that I'm feeling? What's go- why, why am I so agitated? Why? And so we talked about all those questions last week, and I would encourage you to keep on asking your soul the questions, because when you find those questions out, when you get to the bottom of that, it can, it can lead you to a path toward wholeness. Now, today, we're moving on. We're picking up and moving on. But today, to be honest with you, Uh, I'm going to do something that I was not planning on doing at the very beginning. I was planning on doing a message like what we're going to do today, uh, but the route that I'm going to take, I just decided uh, this week when I was preparing for this message to to scrap my original plan and do something that uh, I, I wasn't planning on doing, and I don't even know if it's a good idea that I do what I'm getting ready to do. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Yeah. So, yeah, I don't clap yet. Um, In fact, I think I may need to sit down for this one. Um, so when I was thinking about earlier this week, I just thought, um, you know, I, I want to be a little bit more pastoral this morning than I am in terms of, of teaching, and I want to share a little bit about my heart, but what I'm going to share is a little scary, okay? It's not like a Halloween story. It's just, it's just scary, because I'm going to peel back a layer of my life and, and let you in, and it's just a scary thing. And so I don't want you to be frightened today. I don't want you to think, oh, my gosh, what in the world? But as I thought about this, I thought if, if by sharing this, some of you identify with what my experience has been, then maybe it will encourage you in some regard to take a next step or, or whatever. And so I want to talk to you today about the path that I was on. All right, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the concerns I have as your pastor, and so this is kind of like a family talk, and so if I'm not your pastor, you don't have to pay attention to anything I say today, right? Um, But I'm going to talk to you about the path that I was on that led up uh, to my sabbatical, all right? And here's kind of my world, and this is the scary part. Uh, This is just real raw, so, you know, if you just think, oh my goodness, you know, I think we should go to another church, I completely understand (laughs) And uh, hopefully you'll wait until after I'm done before you leave. And, um, but uh, there was a stretch of a few years where in ministry I felt like I got to the end of the year and then I looked back on that year and I thought, you know, I think that's the most difficult year of ministry I've had in my life. I started in ministry in 1989, so I've been doing this for a while. And there have been a lot of many good years in that, but there have been some difficult years in that too. And so a few years back, there was a stretch of about four or five years where at the end of every year, I looked back on that year and said, that, I think that's the, that's the hardest, most painful year in ministry I've ever had. And so I was ready to go on to get to a new, you know, a better year. And, and so the second year rolled around in that, and I looked back on that, and I'm like, okay, all right, that was, the, that was the most hard, you know, difficult year I've ever had. That was the most challenging, painful year I've ever had. And then the next year rolled around, and I'm like, okay, well, I, I just topped that. So that happened like four years in a row. 
And um, I, I was ready for a better year, you know. I was ready for not so much challenge and not so much heartache and not so much internal uh, kind of pain. And I was really ready for that, but it just it wasn't happening. And so at the end of, um, at the beginning of 2016, I was in a really difficult spot. And I've, I've said this publicly before, but I'm going to kind of put all the dots together on this. I, I talked to a friend and I just, I said, I, I'm, I'm struggling and I, I don't know what to do and I don't know why and I, I just, I need help. And so I was referred to a therapist and I st- started going to counseling at the beginning of 2016 and I did that for about eight or uh, 12 weeks, something like that. I think it was about 12 weeks. And then th- that was helpful. Uh, and so by about March, I was in a different place. I felt like I was doing better and that was all good, but I just internally, I was, I was struggling. And, um, and so March came, April came, and then we got into the spring and, you know, we entered into summer and I felt like things were going a little bit better. Uh, and then, uh, it was kind of like a, a, um, a plane that was getting off the runway and it kind of started to take off, you know, and then all of a sudden the engines fell out and, and that happened in August of, uh, 2016 last year. And so in August, I just started to tank again and, uh, I was in a really, uh, just, painful spot. I, I was in pain physically. I felt like somebody had taken a, a screwdriver and just jabbed it into my shoulder. And I felt like that for about six months. I just, every moment, every day, I was in pain um, physically. Um, then I was, uh, beyond that, I was in pain just internally. Uh, there was, a, and I don't know how to describe this, and maybe you understand what I'm talking about when I just say there was an, there was an uh, there was an anguish of soul. There was an ache in my soul that just was, was painful. I don't know how to describe that other than just saying I was just internally, I was in pain. And so we launched into our fall last uh, September, and, you know, we we're kind of going through this whole thing, and, and I just, I, I couldn't recover. And it's hard because I live a kind of a public life. I lead a, a staff and I, you know, have to show up on, you know, on a day like today and smile and shake hands and, you know, kind of lead the charge. We're right in the middle of a relocation, getting ready to relocate to a new campus here. And, and I was just really, um, I was struggling. I wasn't questioning my calling or what I was supposed to be doing in life, but I just internally, I was, I was miserable. Um, and so it all culminated uh, at the end of uh, last November, November of 2016. And every November, at the end of November, I have a pastor, pastor's gathering. Um, and so last year, I went to it as I normally did, and I flew in uh, to Atlanta. And the place where this gathering was happening was about two, out, two hours outside of Atlanta. And uh, we couldn't check in until about 3 o'clock uh, to the place where the gathering was going to be. But I got there at 11 o'clock in the morning, so I had four hours to kill. And I had a two-hour car drive, and so I thought, well... I will, I'll go halfway and find a Chick-fil-A and, you know, sit in the Chick-fil-A for a couple hours and do some email and work and, you know, just I'll be productive. And so I did. I found a Chick-fil-A in the middle of Georgia, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I sat there for two hours and um, I, it just, uh, to a point where uh, on three different times in that two-hour stretch of time, I just about broke down and just wept in public where I just, I thought I'm going to have, I'm just going to completely melt down right here. And tears filled my eyes and I had no idea. I'm like, what in the world? And I couldn't think, well, you know, this happened and therefore this is why I'm feeling that way. There was no connecting dots. I couldn't, I was like, I have no idea why I'm in the spot that I'm in, but it was, um, it was raw. It was really, really uh, raw. And so I, picked myself up and got in the car and drove on uh, to the, the place where the pastors were gathering. And when I got there, people were, um, you know, they were coming in and everybody was excited to be there, but I wasn't excited to be there. Uh, and so uh, just right when I got onto the campus of where we were going to be, I, the, the gentleman who was kind of in charge of the whole gathering, I saw him and he said, hey, James, great to see you. And I said, hey, you know, and I said, can I talk to you just for a second? He's like, sure. And so I pulled him off to the side, and I, and I told him what I just told you. That I, you know, I went and found a Chick-fil-A, and I, was, I just was a complete wreck. And uh, I said, I, 
I need you to know that, that I'm in a really bad spot right now, and so it's, going to be, it's hard for me to be here because everybody's excited to be here, and they're glad to see everybody that we haven't seen in a year, and you know, they're catching up on what's going on in their church, and I said, I just, I got nothing. And so I just need somebody to know that if you think, what's in the world's wrong? Well, that's what's wrong with me. Like, I'm, I'm a complete mess. And so uh, he was very understanding and encouraged me. And so I went through the next couple of days um, in this thing, showing up, going to all the sessions and listening and, you know, the conversations that were being had around the tables where I was at, you know, I really didn't say a whole lot because I was just, I was in pain. I was in pain. And the last day of that pastor's gathering, uh, they had four different uh, men share about some of the difficult challenges that they had experienced in life. One guy shared about how the previous year was, the, uh, was his dark night of the soul uh, because uh, he had a second grandchild die that year. Four-year-old grandchild, four, four or five-year-old grandson died unexpectedly, tragic death. It's the second time in their family that that had happened. Uh, the result was that his son and his daughter-in-law s- separated and, and went through a, a, just a really awful, tragic divorce. And he just said, you know, we cried out and cried out and cried out. And it just, it was, uh, their whole family was under just a tremendous amount of pain. And he talked about that. And I thought, okay, I, I can get that. Another guy, a uh, pastor who, um, you know, is known across the country in some circles. I don't think that you would know him if I told you his name, but he's, he's known in church leadership circles. Um, he talked about 15 years earlier, a season of his life where he went through some really dark depression. And it was so dark that he, he, he thought about suicide. And he was suicidal. He had suicide, you know, thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it all. And he kind of broke down uh, telling us about that, where it's just a really difficult time. And I, you know, I've, I've never been suicidal in that regard, but I, I could sense, you know, his pain. Another guy was talking about burnout, and their church was going through a relocation like our church was going through, and it was just, it was awful. And he talked about, you know, the difficult spot he was in. And then the fourth guy came up and said, basically, and I'm saying to you what they've all said in public, uh, but he said, I... Uh, I was in a, I, I, my, my marriage was pretty much over. Now, here's a guy leading a church. It's a large church. It's a growing church. And he's saying to his peers, and he subsequently have said to his whole, whole church, my marriage was over. My wife was ready to walk out. There wasn't a moral failure. It was just I was, I, I was impossible to live with. I was impossible to live with. And so, uh, his wife ended up calling the elders of the church and, and said, I'm done, and, you, get, you know, you got to do something with all of this. And so the elders said, you need a sabbatical. You need, you, need, you need a sabbatical. So he went on sabbatical. And when he started to talk about his sabbatical, as I'm sitting there listening, he was the fourth guy in the stories, I just started weeping. I sat there and just started weeping. I thought, that's what I need. I, I can't, I have no idea what's happening to me, but something is happening to me. And I, I have to, I have, I need the space to figure this out. And so I came back that week. I had a, we had a regularly uh, scheduled elders meeting that following week after that uh, pastor's gathering. And I was going to go into that elders meeting and, and just tell our elders and ask our elders, not tell them, but just say, hey, I'm hurting and I, I need a sabbatical. I don't even know what that looks like. Uh, in many of the circles that I'm familiar with, sabbaticals aren't typical. And so I actually talked to a pastor friend of mine and said, how do you talk to your elders about needing a sabbatical? You know, what, what does that even look like? And so I was a little bit nervous about that, to be honest with you. And so I went in, and, uh, and by the way, I have, just so you know, I have a great, healthy relationship with our elders. I have always had a great and healthy relationship with our elders. I've been very transparent with them over the years, and if I'm struggling, I mean, they know it, and I, you know, so it's a great relationship. But saying, I need time to, like, work on this, uh, it was just hard. And so I went in, and I told them of what I just told you. And there were some tears that came along with that because at that moment, I was, I was in pain. I was just in pain. And immediately, they just said, 
James, absolutely, you can have a sabbatical. And, you know, they encouraged me to take it as soon as I needed it. And I just said, you know what, I think if I could take it in May, we're getting ready to open our new campus. I think I'll be fine with that. But knowing that it's in the future, knowing that I'm going to have the space and the time to, like, work on whatever is broken inside of me, I think that'll be good. And so they agreed to that, and and, uh, they just said, take whatever time that you need. And I said, I think, you know, three months would be good. And they said, that's fine. Uh, you know, and so that night, um, they put me, and we, we do this sometimes when we have somebody come into our elders meeting, they put me in a chair, and uh, they all came around, and uh, they laid hands on me and prayed for me. And um, that was a healing time. And so uh, I, you know, powered through December in uh, January, and in January, I was still in a bad spot. I just really was. And, um, but things started to turn a little bit. Things internally started to get better. I think just knowing the sabbatical was out there and, and, uh, and doing that. And so I, I, um, I, I, I spoke a few weeks ago what the sabbatical did for me. And, uh, but I, I thought today I might just jump off a cliff and tell you what I just told you. And that's kind of a scary thing. Um, because there, yeah, you know. Um, and it's hard for someone in my position um, in terms of, because I lead a very public life. Like I said, I, you know, I've got a staff to lead, and I'm supposed to show up. And people like me aren't supposed to have a bad day. Like, you know, it, the pastor's always got to be on. He's always got to be happy and this and that and the other. And they're just, you know, for months, I just wasn't. And, and so I would show up and just power through. And, um, you know, I don't think after, as a result of going and, you know, having the intensive that I was able to have that I've talked to you about uh, and, and go through that, it wasn't that I was in burnout mode because I loved what I did. It was just, like I said last week, there were things that piled up over the years on my soul. Uh, difficult experiences, relational pain, uh, and different things that landed on my soul, and, and my soul wasn't healing. I thought, okay, in a, in a couple of weeks I'll be better, and in, in a way I felt like I was better, but it was just I was growing numb on the inside, and that numbness of soul and pain led me to where I was last year. Physically, it was taking a toll on me. Internally, it was taking a toll on me, and I just wasn't uh, good for pretty much anybody around me. I just It was just... It was just, uh, it was just awful, really, honestly. Um, and um, guys don't like to talk about what I just said. Nobody wants to admit what I just admitted. No one wants to say, "Hey, you know, here's the real deal. Here's what's really going on uh, with me." And so I was in that kind of that danger zone, you know. And my concern uh, is that. If I can wind up like that, then uh, I'm assuming that maybe you can too. That all of us could wind up in a danger zone where there are things happening on the inside of us. There are things happening in our souls uh, that are leading us to a bad place, that are leading us to a lot of pain, that are leading us to a lot of bad decisions sometimes. And we, you know, we are forced down a path because of that pain, and it's a danger zone. And what I want to talk to you today uh, about a couple things, I'm, we're going to a couple scriptures, um, but what I am learning is, and I've known this, but I really have, I really have learned this, uh, there are some enemies of our soul, and I didn't take these enemies very seriously. Like, during all of this, you know, the, well, in ministry, I had gotten to a point where I wasn't taking a, a true real day off. Like, I was working seven days a week. And, and more than that, when I would go home, I would work at home. And so I wasn't even present when I was at home. And, uh, and again, I think that, that was helping me feel alive. I spoke about that last week, you know, where my mind was always going about stuff. And, and I learned that, hey, the reason why that's like that is because I'm numb on the inside. And, and this is the thing that makes me feel alive. And so I was going through that. And I, I didn't realize that at the time. And, um, and what I have learned and what I... I want to like throw a a penalty flag out there so everyone knows it. We'll just like stop the game and say, okay, you you know, you have many enemies of your soul, but two of them are hurry, hurry in life and busyness. 
and they're related. They're related. Hurry uh, can be just, um, for example, I, I've got a friend that sometimes I, I travel with in terms of, you know, we'll go from city to city or something. And this friend likes to be early to everything. And so when we're flying someplace, we'll get to the airport two and a half hours before our flight. Like, that's poor time management, in my opinion. Like, if you get there just before they close the door to the plane, you have managed your time exceedingly well. Two and a half hours. So, I, you know, we'll be like, all right, we'll show up at the airport two and a half hours, you know, early. And so we'll get there, we'll check our bags, and this guy pretty much is at a jog going through the airport, like to the gate. And I'm thinking, we got two hours, why are we running, you know? Well, I don't understand this, but there's just this hurry, 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 wait, 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 come on, come on. And I'm like, you know, if we hadn't gotten here two hours early, we wouldn't even be waiting. But anyway... But it's that. It's like you're always in a hurry. It, it, it's, the, it's the, you go into the grocery store or you go into, a, you know, a place where you're buying stuff at Lowe's or Costco or wherever it is, and you've got your cart, and then as you're coming up, you're starting to look over the aisles to see which has the, the shortest line in it. Like, you don't have anything to do for a while, but you're just like, I don't want to spend one minute longer in any of these lines that I need to. Or you go to the express checkout lane that has 15 items, and you get up behind somebody, and then you're peeking around them, and you're like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eight. They've got 16. They're going to waste my time, you know? It's just that, it's that hurry. And that's an enemy of your soul. The cousin of hurry is busyness. And busyness is a schedule that just goes from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And at the end of the day, you'd like drop down exhausted because all day long from morning until night, you've been going, 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 and you just, you're, you just collapse. And it's busyness. It is a packed schedule. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing with a caveat. But hurry and busyness are the enemy of our soul. I find myself always in a hurry. I find myself always busy. And the soul, listen, the soul is not made for busyness and it's not made for hurry. It's made for hard work, but it's not made for busyness and it's not made for hurry. And we can go all the way back to the beginning. And God was very clear about this. Genesis chapter one and two, God creates the world, and, and you know the story, and again, we, you know, if you don't believe that Genesis is a real historical account, that's okay, but for our purposes today, just walk with me through this. Genesis chapter two, it says this, by the seventh day, God had what? Finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day, he what? Rested from all his work. Was God tired? No, not necessarily, but he did all of his work, and when his work was done, he rested. Why did he rest? He rested to set an example. He rested to set us a model. He rested so that we would do what he did. And yet, in American culture especially, we don't do this, do we? Like Monday morning, people come back to work after the weekend, and they are rested. They're exhausted. Exhausted. And so it says in the next verse, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. In other words, he made it special. He set it apart. That's what the word holy means, to be set apart for a special purpose. He made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. God rested. And in the very beginning, God is saying to us, and the scripture is saying to us, the soul needs rest. The soul is made for work because we find out in Genesis that God created man. And he put him in a perfect environment. And a part of that perfect environment was work. Work was not a result of the curse. Work was a part of the perfect life. But so was rest. And we blow right past rest. In fact, it is so important that when we come to the book of Exodus, God gives the Ten Commandments. And this is what he says. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, by setting it apart, in other words. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. 
God created you. He breathed life into your soul. And that seventh day is supposed to be set apart for what? God and for rest. There's something about resting that connects us with our Heavenly Father. And when we don't know how to rest, guess what we have struggled doing? Connecting with God. People have been walking with Jesus for years and years and years, and yet they feel distant from him. And one of the reasons why I think sometimes they feel distant is because they're just going from pillar to post 24-7 all the time. And it's hard to draw closer to God in a relationship with him when you are hurried and busy all of the time. And God, from the very beginning, said, hey, 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 there's supposed to be a Sabbath. There's supposed to be a, a, a day of rest. You know what this, the word Sabbath means? It means to cease from working. To cease from working. The scripture goes on. On it, on the Sabbath, you shall not do any work. Okay, well, then I'll delegate. No, no, you can't do that. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor anybody traveling through your city, or in your towns, right? For in six days, it says, again, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. We're not supposed to delegate our work. We're supposed to rest. We're supposed to shut down. We're supposed to be in, on that day of resting. We're supposed to be unproductive, and I can look out there right now and just see, this is a group of people that has no idea how to be unproductive. Like, unproductivity is a curse word in our society. What'd you get done today? The right answer is, a lot. The wrong answer is, <laughs> nothing. Like, I was a total zilch today. But that's what the Sabbath is all about. That's what resting is all about. It's about being unproductive. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you were really like unproductive for an entire day? I don't mean when's the last time you had a day off. I mean when's the last time you had a day off and you did nothing productive in that day? Some of you have to say, I'll see. I think it was about a year, maybe two years ago. You see, here's our bottom line for today. It simply is this. My soul needs space and rest in order to thrive. My soul needs space and rest in order to thrive. And the reason so many of us are not thriving in our souls is because there's no space in our soul. We have no idea how to rest. I had no idea how to rest. I had no idea that my soul needed space like it did. And I was bumping up against a wall because I wasn't giving my soul space. And I didn't know how to rest. I didn't know how to be unproductive. Like I, if I went home, I, I felt guilty for like doing nothing. I felt like I needed to be doing something. And over my sabbatical, one of the things, I, I told you about this a couple weeks ago, one of the things was I, just, I had to say no to doing things like projects that needed to be done around the house. I just said no to. Now, on the flip side of that, guess what I still have? Projects to do around the house. And I'm, I'm you know, slowly getting to those and maybe one day. But how do you be unproductive sometimes? And I'm not talking about being unproductive like for a week at a time. I'm being, I mean just being unproductive for a day. Like you can work your, you know, knock yourself out for six days. But be unproductive for one day. That's hard, isn't it? I spoke to a friend recently, and uh, he just said, hey, I haven't had a day off in three weeks. He's in a high-pressure deal. I talked to another friend that he just said, you know what, I, 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 the most I've ever taken off in any, uh, uh, in any time in my life is seven days. I've had a seven-day vacation, but it wasn't really a vacation because I took my work with me. Like, I worked on vacation, but I was only, I've only been away from the office for seven days, but even when I'm gone, I work. And we're, I mean, in some facets of our culture, 
that would be applauded. They'd be like, man, you're amazing because they're, you know, accomplishing a lot, hard driving, you know, successful and all that. And I just have a concern. The more people I talk to, the more I find that's like the reality. We don't know how to shut it down. We don't know how to rest. We don't know how to have space for our soul. And so I have a concern for you as your pastor. I have a concern for you and for your family. Like, in our culture, um, if you're not busy, you're basically a failure. Like, if you're not doing everything everybody else is, you're a failure. And you look around, and everybody's involved in this and that and the other, and they're going, 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 and you're just thinking, man, I'm losing out on life if I don't do all of the things that everybody else is doing. And what we're doing is we're killing ourselves on the inside. We're killing ourselves on the inside because our soul needs space. Our soul needs rest. And we are in a culture that just says no rest, no space. Just go, 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 go. The more you pack into your life, the fuller your life will be. And that is a lie. It's a lie. The busyness of life robs us of life. The busyness of life robs us of life. Hurry in life robs us of life. And here's another concern that I have, and I've had this for a long time, but I've, grown, I've watched this over the last several years, and, and I've watched it in kids. And I just want to talk to the parents. And I don't mean to be guilt. I don't, I'm not trying to throw guilt on you or anything like that. But some of you feel what I'm talking about today. You're exhausted on the inside. You would just say, you know what, I just feel thin on the inside. Like I'm, I, I, I'm fried. But you're picking up and moving on just like everybody else around you. And some of you have hit the wall and some of you are headed toward that wall. And it's going to impact your family. It's going to impact your career. It's, gonna, it's just going to impact. There's going to be a ripple effect. But I'm concerned about kids in our culture too. There is more stress. There are more kids going to therapy today because they're stressed out. There are more kids on medication today because of the intense pressure and stress that they feel. And, and we, adults, put that on them. We allow that to come into their lives. You know, we've got schools, and I, and I love education, but we've got schools that, I mean, it's just a pressure. It's like your kids have got to go to the right middle school. They've got to go to the right, you know, elementary school. They've got to get in the right high school. got to get in the right programs. They've got to get, do all the things so they can get accepted to the right college. Because if they don't get accepted to the right college, then they won't have hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and no job. And we want them to have hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and no job. So we got to get, you know, and so we just go through all the thing. And then we, you know, and then we just like, oh, 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 oh. And then maybe if we're, you know, if we work really hard at this, they'll get us, you know, an athletic scholarship. And that'll pay for the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so we put them in travel sports and it's just, and they're just going, going, going. And kids are breaking down. They're just, they're not designed for the pressure that we as Americans and as adults allow for them. And parents, my goodness, your kids' souls are getting trashed because of hurry and busyness. And I, I got four kids, and I know they at times have experienced a wounded soul. But one of the things that we tried to do, I don't know how well we did it, we just, we tried to stay out. We didn't put our kids in, you know, when our kids were little, um, they had exceptional eye-hand coordination. I mean, like from early ages. And I could have put them in T-ball, and I could have done all that stuff. We just didn't. We just did not do it. And then when, they, when we started doing those things, we just said, okay, we got four kids, but we were only doing one sport at a time. So one, one of our kids would be in a sport, and the rest of us would go and watch. And then when the next one was in the sport, the other one wasn't in it, we just did one sport at a time. And what we've, what we've done, that's not typical, is it? What we do is we just say, okay, we're going to do, everybody's in their thing. They got dance, or they got, you know, this, or piano, or this, or that, and the other, soccer, baseball, whatever it is, and we just go, 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 go. I have a friend who 
has raised his kids. He's got three boys. He raised his kids, and uh, he's been empty nester for uh, a few years now. And uh, a while back, I was talking with him about this very thing, and he said, uh, and he, they're uh, Christians, they're followers of Jesus. He and his wife have a, have a deep faith. But as their kids were growing up, as their boys were growing up, they were into, like, headlong into soccer. I mean, they did soccer uh, from, you know, the early ages, and one of the kids got a scholarship in soccer. And, I mean, like, it was a big deal. And when they were all teenagers, uh, they were really into the travel deal. And so he and his wife, on the weekends, every weekend, every single weekend, they were gone doing, you know, travel soccer. And they would be at two different or three different tournaments on the same weekend. And it was, a, it was good family time. They did all that kind of stuff. But as he reflected on all that and, and the path that some of his sons have taken in life, this is what he said to me. He looked at me and just said, James, it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it. Because the thing that they needed the most, they didn't get. And that was space for their soul. And although their parents were Christians and believers, they didn't grow up in a community of faith, really. They grew up on a soccer field. And that did nothing for their soul. Yeah, it taught them teamwork. Yeah, it taught them dependability. Yeah, it taught them hard work, all those good things. And those are all good things. But it wasn't good for their soul. Oftentimes when I'll talk about something like this, people will say, I'm too busy. And the first thing that they'll do is they'll say, they'll come to somebody on our staff and say, you know what, I can't serve anymore. I'm done. I'm just too busy. And it always breaks my heart because it's like, why is it the first thing that goes is our involvement in a community of faith? They never go to the, the baseball coach and say, you know what, we're just too busy, we're quitting. Because let me tell you something. When Mary and Martha had Jesus in their home, Mary was at the feet of Jesus listening. She was sitting, she was doing nothing. Martha was in the other room, busy, 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 busy. And then she came out to Jesus and she says, Jesus, will you tell my idiot sister to get in here and help? She didn't quite say it that way. That's my translation of that text. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to do that. Because she has chosen the most important thing. And she's not doing anything right now. She's just sitting. She's just resting. You know, uh, the Psalm 23, it's a familiar psalm, right? How's it go? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. Now think about that. Just for, what are you doing when you're lying down? Nothing. Sheep are really good at doing nothing. They eat and they sleep. And the psalmist says, the Lord leads me to green pastures and he makes me lie down because he knows my soul needs rest. My soul needs to be unproductive. And so we need to create space for the soul. Uh, a few years ago, actually more than a few, a number of years ago, I was on a a cruise, a ship, you know, cruise out in the, the ocean type thing. I don't know if you know what that is or not. But anyway, and I had the opportunity to go on about 10 or 12 different cruises over my lifetime. And uh, basically, I would be able to go on these cruises, and I taught a group of people. So there was a teaching component of it, a worship. And so uh, they would bring me along, and I would teach. Uh, and so on this particular cruise, um, there was a guy on the ship I was greeted by a Mennonite family, like they were going on this, yes, I said Mennonite family on a ship, on a, on a cruise ship, and I thought, well, that's odd. And uh, so they went on, I'm like, I'm not sure why they're here, but my goodness, and come to find out, they were actually a part of the group that I was going to be teaching. And so as it came, uh, I was able to have dinner with them pretty much every night that week. And it was just kind of like, oh, my gosh, you know, what do you talk about? It's like we're, I felt like we were worlds apart. They were delightful people. How many of you have ever known any Amish or Mennonite people? Yeah, a number of you have, right? So they're, they're great people. But it's kind of like, you know, what do you talk about? And so here's a picture of them at dinner. And uh, the really fun thing about this picture is you see the young couple there. Uh, they were on their honeymoon, and that is her mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. A wonderful family. 
I did not ask if they had separate rooms, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and so I learned, I didn't know a whole lot about uh, what their experience was. I'd never really talked to any, anybody who was Mennonite or, or Amish, and I found out that the Amish are the really, really, really conservative ones. They don't have electricity in their homes. They ride the horse and buggies and that kind of thing. The Mennonites are the liberal of the group. They have electricity in their homes. They actually ride in cars and things like that. But they were talking about going on a cruise uh, in the next couple of years, and they were going to go to Alaska, and they were going to drive all the way to Alaska from where they lived in, in, the, uh, in Ohio. They lived in northern Ohio. And I'm like, why would you drive to Alaska to go on a cruise? They said, because we don't fly. And I said, why don't you fly? I mean, I, I'm like, really? And they said, here's the answer. The young man answered to me, he said, the reason why we don't fly is because it speeds up the pace of life too much. And I thought, so you're going to take three weeks to drive to Alaska just to slow it down a little bit. <laughs> now, I don't say that to bring guilt on anybody because I have not driven to Alaska, but I've been there. And, and so I just thought, well, that, and that has stuck with me. That when we are going, 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 sometimes it just, it speeds up the pace of life. We just, we think I can get more done and getting more done is not necessarily helpful. And so when it comes to you, when it comes to your kids, I just, I just want to appeal to you. Don't let busyness and don't let hurry rob you of life because that's what it does. That's what it does. And I've experienced that personally, and I'll, I'm betting pretty much everybody in this room has experienced that. So parents, I'm just going to tell you something. The Lord made the Sabbath so that we would rest and the Lord made the Sabbath so that we would rest and connect with him. And when we say, you know what, I need some time away or I need I, something in my schedule needs to break, don't let it be your connection to God. Don't let it be your connection to your community of faith. Over the years, you know, 30 years ago, people came to church three times a month. And then it became twice a month over the last, you know, 15 or 20 years or so. It's, it's twice a month. Now, I, as I talk to church leaders, attendance in churches is going down. It's not because people are leaving the church. It's because they're so busy they can only come every, once every five to six weeks. And I'm just thinking, how is that helping? Really, how, how is that helping? I don't ever hear people say, you know what, my life started going better when I stopped connecting with my community of faith. We've hijacked and, and, and foregone the thing that's really most important. And so I just, as your pastor, I just want to say, don't rob your soul of the space and the rest that it needs. You say, well, James, what do I do with this? There are four things. Okay, this is, this is helpful. Hopefully it'll be helpful. The first thing is simply this. You've got to create space for yourself in four specific ways. Number one, unplug from electronics. Unplug from electronics. Yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> it is a growing epidemic, addiction, to cell phones. Addiction to cell phones. Like you, you get in an elevator, everybody's doing this. You're driving down the road, everybody's doing this. <laughs> you know? Just turn it off. But what if someone needs me? Here's the thing, and I, wanna, I want you to relax on this. If someone needs you, if they really, really need help, there's three numbers, 911. And that does not ring to your cell phone. You know, I mean, if your palms got sweaty when I said shut it off, you have an addiction to your cell phone. Okay? Uh, social media. I mean, some of you are addicted to social media. Like you just read your news feed all day long, and, and, you, and it just, does, it, does your news feed help you? No! doesn't help you 
It doesn't breathe life into your soul. What's it do? It gets you anxiety. It gets, you know, and, and then there's pressure like, oh, they did this and they did that, and my life sucks because I don't do those things. And they posted pictures of their newly renovated house, and mine looks like, you know, just take a break from social media. Take a break from TV. I mean, seriously, give your soul the space that it needs to heal, to rest. Unplug from electronics, all right? Second thing that you can do is have a five-minute pause. <laughs> oh, I laugh because this is going to scare you, all right? I want you, this is one of the things I want you to do this week, all right? I want you to find five minutes this week, maybe every day. That would be a good thing. Five minutes every day this week, and for five minutes, like, shut your eyes and do nothing. Try not to think. If you want to, you know, just think of the, the only verse in the Bible that you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever. It, just think about that verse for five minutes and do nothing. And just sit there. And if thoughts come into your mind, just say, no, 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 I'm not going to think about that. That's a scary thing. Because I promise you, you'll be, uh, you'll be 30 seconds into it and think it's been five minutes. Like, my gosh, how long is this going to be? We have a hard time spending five minutes in silence. We get into our cars, what's the first thing we do? Turn on the radio. You know, we come home from the end of the day, what's the first thing we do? Turn on the TV. We are afraid of silence. We are afraid of a space because in that space, what happens is we're alone with our thoughts and our thoughts are painful. And then all of a sudden we start to feel and so we just think, you know what? If I just fill my time up with stuff all the time, it'll be good, it numbs me. But just this week, every day, just carve out five minutes just a five-minute pause. Okay, for the next five minutes, I'm going to do nothing, and I'm just going to sit there in silence. All right? Third thing, be utterly unproductive for blank hours. You fill in the blank. Be utterly unproductive for blank hours. Five hours. Pick a day this week that on that day you're going to schedule yourself to literally be unproductive. How many of you feel, with just me saying that, that I have violated you in some way? <laughs> You're like, oh, what? Yeah, that you go out to your back porch or wherever it is and you just sit and you just sit and do, you don't watch TV, you don't do anything, you just sit there for five hours. You're like, James, I thought five minutes was going to be a hard time. <laughs> five hours, uh-huh. And then when you get good at five hours, stretch that into 12. Or for 12 hours, you're just unproductive. And then stretch that into 24. And when you hit that 24, you know what you've hit? Uh, your wife. <laughs> <laughs> And our next marriage series is on, you know, our next series is on marriage, so anyway. Now, when you hit 24 hours, you hit a Sabbath. That's what a Sabbath is. That's what Sabbath is, 24 hours of time where you're unproductive, where you, where you don't do anything. And that's just, it just helps you recharge. So be utterly unproductive this week for five hours on one day, just one day. I'm not, I'm not saying be unproductive for the entire week. That's not what I'm saying. Work hard all week, but just this week, be unproductive for five hours. You have my permission. You have my permission. Actually, it's better than that. You have God's permission. Actually, it's better than that. You have God's command. The next thing, and last, is to simplify your life. To simplify your life. <laughs> Here's what I know about you. It's too complicated. There's too much. There's too much. You know how to simplify your life? It's really simple. There's one thing that you can do. It's simply to say this word. No. That's how you simplify. No, we're not going to do it. Um, just 
uh, not too long ago, my wife and I were supposed to be at a meeting. We we're going to go into this meeting, and uh, we were actually kind of walking in at the time. And it was a day where we needed space. And we were walking in. We were expected to be there. And in the parking lot, as we were walking in, I just said, no. And she said, but we're here. We're like ha- almost in. And I said, no. Let's go. We're going to just go for a drive. We're going to do something. But we're not, we need space right now. And uh, that was hard. And we disappointed some people. And oh, well. That's how you simplify your life. There are things to say, you know what? We're not going to do four sports this, this time around. We're just not. No. We're not going to do all the extracurricular activities. No. We're not going to do, uh, you know, the 17 parties that, you know, we were supposed to. No, we're just not going to do it. When somebody asks you to go and do whatever, you just, sometimes you have to say, I, no. So this is, I just want to make sure that you can actually do this. So on the count of three, just, I want you to say out loud with some gusto. No, one, two, three. No. Gosh, that was, that was pretty good. <clears throat> Okay? No. That's how you simplify. Here's the bottom line. My soul needs space and rest in order to thrive. And as your pastor, I I love you, and I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty today. But unless we get this right, we're going to ruin our soul. God, I, I know how um, kind of this may be landing in many of our hearts, and I pray, Father, that um, the most positive way that it could land, that it lands that way, that we don't feel guilted, that we don't feel bad, but we feel empowered, really, uh, to take control of some areas and just say no and to get the space for our soul and the rest for our soul that we need. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us uh, this week find time just for a pause, that we find time for a few hours, if not five, just a couple at least, just to say, I'm going to be unproductive during this block of time. And that we start learning how to rest, that we start learning how to give our soul space so that our soul can thrive. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.